Hi friends, my name is Darren Gertis and I'm going to review the headlines in Ukraine today. It is day 288 since the Russians invaded Ukraine. I'm starting here. This is Time. Zelensky was made the uh, Time Person of the Year with the Spirit of Ukraine. So it's both him and the Spirit of Ukraine are part of this. Um, NPR carried this. Uh, Zelensky and the Spirit of Ukraine or Time Magazine's 2022 Person of the Year. And they said a few interesting things. The story is, of course, not fully written yet, Zelensky has really galvanized the world in a way we haven't seen in decades. That's from the editor-in-chief, and he, he's absolutely right. That's exactly true. This is a once-in-a-generation leader. It's somebody that we have not seen since perhaps Churchill that has had the, that's captured the imagination by standing up to aggression as he has. Um, so yesterday on Facebook, I posted this. This is 20 hours ago. It says, well-deserved. That's all I said and posted this cover. And I got 101 comments. This was crazy, the amount of, of comments that I got. Now, there were some likes, of 61 likes, but there was also a lot of, like, really, like, um, like, for laundering money for Democrats, maybe. I'm like, no, Zelensky's a real hero standing up to Putin's aggression. Separate that from Biden. Credit where credit's due. And so now a lot of the pushback became because people were seeing because Biden was supporting him, conservatives then pushed back the other direction. Oh, well, he must be this. <laughs> okay. Uh, Democrats do this too. It's just a, 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 but, but I've seen some people on here that like are really otherwise decent, normal human beings who on this are just so ill-informed about what they're saying about him. And I'm just like, wow, that's, that is just absolutely amazing uh, that that people had these kinds of opinions. So one of the big pushes, and this is my page I put in the community this morning, I asked this question. Yesterday, I posted a Time Magazine cover on Facebook, and I was stunned by otherwise intelligent people who I know and I've worked with. Now, these are people on Facebook, by the way, these are all people that I actually know right? Uh, on LinkedIn, as long as you're not a prostitute or a terrorist or drug dealer, as long as it appears that you're not one of those things, I'll let anybody in on, on LinkedIn. On Facebook, I do it differently. So I know these people and yet they're just in this like bizarre um, Russian propaganda uh, echo chamber of, of what's going on. So um, yesterday I posted the Time Magazine cover on Facebook and I was stunned by otherwise intelligent people who I know and have worked with that have sp uh, spouted Russian talking points. Particularly notable this time was an emphasis on the FTX scandal, that is the crypto scandal that's been in the news involving crypto, American Democrats mostly, and tying that to Ukraine because Ukraine took donations in crypto. And the other was the banning of the Russian uh, Orthodox Church, which it's actually the Ukraine Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriot, but that's the easiest way of saying it. I'm looking for solid, credible sources to refute this. Uh, would you, uh, you would be amazed at the wild assertions and incorrect uh, info being spouted. What have you seen on either topic from a solid, credible source? Thank you all in advance. So we're all learning together. We're all growing together. If you see uh, legitimate sources saying something of substance, please just post it. I, I, help me help everyone in the community to be able to refute these because there is legitimately a propaganda informational war going on here. Okay, uh, enough said with that. So with that, here is one of those two pillars. Now, I'm not going to talk about the FTX bit today. I might do that in another episode later on, but I, I, I'm not going to do that today. But here's part of the, what's going on with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriot, uh, Patriarchate or however you pronounce that. A local rector of this particular cathedral was present in the Kremlin during the ceremony of annexation of the four regions. That might be a problem, right? I mean, you're in the middle of the war. During a search at the church premises, a permit for a federal counselor of military and civilian administration of the Russian Federation and Russian passports of local priests were found. They were issued this year during the occupation of Herzan. Not, not enough in and of itself, but you're starting to see a case build. A library with Russian propaganda literature were found at this particular monastery. And then former criminals, and it goes, the list goes on and on. And so now you got to thread this needle very carefully. I don't want to see churches banned unnecessarily or whatever, but if they're being used as conduits to war aims, now you've got to be, you've got a whole different problem set and you need to deal with it as that problem set. So uh, that's what's going on there. I'll follow up on both of these. I skipped over it before because it just wasn't relevant to what I, whatever I was talking about before, but we'll be paying more attention to it as we move forward in the future.
At the same time, the SBU was looking into this mayor from the Lviv region who was just engaged in simple corruption. So if, the, if they're looking at simple corruption all the way up to potential war crimes or war involvement or whatever, yeah, I mean, they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, this uh, article in, in uh, political I found really interesting. You may get Ukraine may get a lifeline from NATO. They found that there were funds earmarked for Afghanistan that hadn't been spent to the tunes of a few a few billion dollars, three point four billion dollars to help support um, the effort to fight Russia. They can transfer that from the Afghan fund to the uh, Ukrainian fund to help them support. And you know, three point four billion is nothing to turn your nose at. So that might be something in the works going down the line. Next, explosions. Uh, explosion shakes Russia occupied Sevastopol as fighting rages in eastern Ukraine. Now, I just talked about this. Two days ago, three days ago, we were talking about the drones that are hitting inside Russia in uh, the um, Angles 2 Air Base and in other places, the oil depot, whatever. And, and so I said at the same time that, look, you're in range of Moscow. You can hit Sevastopol. So what has happened? Uh, the Kremlin says that Russia annexed Crimea remains vulnerable to Ukrainian attacks after officials there said the Russian Navy had shot down a drone near Sevastopol Black Sea Fleet Naval Base. And they said in Crimea, a powerful explosion rang out over the central part of Sevastopol early on December 8th was a result of a downing of a drone by a Russian Navy ship. There are certainly risks because the Ukrainian side, now listen to how the Russian uh, Dmitry Pe uh, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov says this, there are certainly risks because the Ukrainian side continues its policy of organizing terrorist attacks. But on the other hand, information we get indicates that effective countermeasures are being taken. They always come up with, well, we're still, we're handling it. We're, we're great. We're awesome. But they're calling it terrorist attack. If you're attacking your enemy's military base, that's not a terrorist attack. That's a legitimate military target. And they're able to do this now. And the Russians are getting really nervous, both in Crimea as well as inland within a thousand mile range within, I mean, a thousand kilometer range, I'm sorry, within Russia as well. So that's what's going on there. Let's keep moving and talk about what's going on in Bakhmut. Battle for Bakhmut keeps raging. Uh, Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. This is what Bakhmut looks like. And that's why I wanted to show you this, because I want to show you some of the pictures as well. It, it's described as a meat grinder due to being on the forefront of trench warfare, shelling, and assaults. Now, you look at this. This is a city. It looks like any other city. It's being hammered. And you would think, wait a minute, that doesn't look like, you know, trench warfare. Well, that's because this is the city itself that they want to take. The trenches are outside the city. Well, what do you mean? Let's look at this. This is an aerial map. This uh, Christmas tree light looking thing is Bakhmud. And this is what's all around it. It's like farmland. And so if you look at that farmland, the Russians have to come from here and from down here up into to take Bakhmud. It's, it's like a city surrounded by pastures all around it. And it really reminded me of Gettysburg. Like if you are familiar with American history and the Civil War, Pickett's charge, they, they had a charge. I was at Gettysburg on a like a three-day um, tour of the of the battlefield. It was an academic kind of thing. We're, we're seeing like who, who did what where and that kind of thing. And walked across the battlefield just thinking to myself, I can't believe people actually physically walked into gunfire that far. This is a, the site of the Union Cannon. So they had to go from the far tree line all the way across this about a mile long in order to get to the ridge line where they were eventually pushed back. That's the high point for the South of the American Civil War. That's kind of the, what they're experiencing here. And the Russians just simply cannot take it. Anytime they do take it, they get slaughtered. So that's what's going on with Bakhmut. Okay. Um, in other news, U.S. basketball star Brittany Grenier has been released from a Russian jail. She's being traded for a notorious arms dealer who has been held in a U.S. prison for 12 years. Now, I'm a fairly conservative guy, and I don't think that I would uh, agree with probably any of Brittany Grenier's um, uh, political positions at all, but I'm incensed that Russia would capture an American and use them, use that person as a token, as a, as a pawn in this little game, because they're trying to score these political points. Like I, like we, she and I would not agree on probably anything, but she's an American first and foremost. And so th this just isn't cool. Now, I, I also think that, you know, 
Putin didn't do his homework. Like the, he sees Brittany Grenier and doesn't understand that she is not like Michael Jordan or Sean, uh, uh, Steph Curry. Like, oh, by the way, I taught Steph's little brother a leadership class about 12 years ago. That's just free. That doesn't have anything to do with anything. But like he didn't capture like these guys. He captured Brittany Grenier. I, I don't think that it's cool at all that that he would take an American and use this, whoever it is, as, as a pawn. But it wasn't really the great prize that he thought it would be, but now they got her, uh, got her back, and it's, uh, you know, Biden is going to take a victory lap for that. Okay, uh, Putin, let's shift gears again. Putin says the fight in Ukraine could be long. Zelensky vows not to leave any Ukrainians behind. So I want you to key in on Putin's words here. We're not going to talk about Zelensky's side of this. Putin, who met in a televised meeting of his Human Rights Council, <laughs> okay. Now, when he meets in these kind of televised meetings, it's all like um, uh, political theater, by the way, uh, said that the special military operation could go on for a long time. And he called Russia's annexation of part of the territories of Ukraine a major achievement of the operation, right? Capturing those four oblasts and then essentially the Sea of Azov becomes an inland port, right? Um Putin allowed, uh, Putin vowed to consistently fight for our interests and to protect ourselves using all ava means available and reiterated his claim that he had no choice but to send troops into Ukraine. He did have a choice. He made the choice. He is the cause of what's going on. But he said, of course, this could be a very lengthy process. He's not giving up his mentality. I've seen nothing in his mentality going, you know what, I guess we just ought to just get on with it and be over with. No, he's just hoping that as time goes on, time's going to be on his side, just like he's hoping that winter is going to be on his side. Okay, Joe Biden and Rishi Sunak, that's the prime minister of uh, the UK, agree to increase gas exports from the US to the UK, according to The Guardian. Now, this I thought was really interesting for a different reason. And I don't know what the details are because they weren't provided and I'm going to be seeing more over time. But if this means increased energy production, that's great. If it just means uh, more being shipped out, that's terrible for Americans because what that will mean is higher prices domestically. But if they're going to increase production, great. I mean, that's uh, Biden put the, like the, the lid on production um, very early on, like, like one of the first things that he was doing. So let's see how this all plays out. Biden has agreed to a deal to ramp up gas exports from the U.S. to the U.K. It's part of a joint effort to cut bills and limit Russia's impact. Uh, an energy security and affordability partnership under the deal the U.S. aims to more than double the amount of liquefied natural gas exported to the U.K. over the coming year compared with 2021. Again, if it's because of increased production, it's good. If it's because of just, we're going to ship you more, maybe not so much because that means it's going to be more expensive here. Okay. Uh, similarly, the U EU states uh, agree to a $60 per uh, barrel cap on Russian oil uh, after the Polish green light. But if you get down into the fine print and you start to see stuff like, well, l let's go down. Um, however, security experts of the CS. Uh, IS think tank have suggested that the cap at $60 is toothless. Why? Since it's above the price existing of Russian oil prices of $52 a barrel. So a $60 cap for a $52 a barrel doesn't make that much of a difference. You're still selling the oil and it's kind of useless. It's more, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say that it's political theater, but it's not really helping the situation any. It's, it's, um, Theoretically, it could become a thing if the rate rises, but okay. It's been estimated that Russian oil is sold at a profit from 40 to $45 a barrel, but the Russia's true extraction costs are hard to estimate. Yeah, okay. So if you were down below $40 a barrel, then this would really be meaningful and it would really hurt the Russians, but, and the Russian economy has built a third on their, their energy production. That's a third of their budget. So, uh, yeah, if you really wanted to hurt them, that's how you would do it. Okay. Now we'll have some fun with Russian state media. Okay. The first article, a Polish writer is shocked to find out that Russians will not rise to topple Putin. Okay. Remember now that this is being uh, pervade in Pravda. Just, just understand that as we move forward. After a trip to Russia, Polish writer Maya Hwolny concluded that the West did not even have a close idea of how things really were in the Russian Federation. The Russians are waiting for their inevitable victory, and they do not even think about a possibility for the West to win, she said. Now again, remember, this is in Pravda. Now, 
they they said something really really interesting. The Russians want Stalin back. Like they really want they want a strong man. Uh, Wolny pointed out that the Russians spoke positively of Stalin. There was no endless negativity about him in their words. Like forget about the forty million or however many million killed people were killed in Stalin's era. Uh, she was struck by the fact that the Russians do not see the time of Stalin's rule as a traumatic experience, despite the gulag camps. The Russians even dare to erect monuments to Joseph Stalin and want Stalin to return, she said. The problem, in her opinion, was that the West is counting on resistance within Russia. The Western media have prepared numerous reports about thousands of Russians fleeing the country, and it seemed that the nation was on the verge of a major coup. However, such expectations are futile, she acknowledged. Now remember, they may or may not be. There are thousands of people fleeing the country. Like you have a million male, military age males that have gotten out of the country since this happened. But does that mean that they're on the verge of a coup? No. But what we do know is that internal polling numbers have gone down, way down on what, who actually supports the war. But again, this is, this is consumption for Russian and Russian sympathetic kind of um, readers. So, oh, there's no coup here. Nothing to see here. Okay. Wolny is now confident that First, there is no chance for the protest phenomenon to consolidate, turn into a million strong street demonstrations that could sweep away the authorities. That may or may not be true. She's saying that this is not the case. But again, Russia is going to amplify that message because that's what Russian propaganda does. And second, rumors about Putin's alleged incurable disease and Vladimir Putin are only rumors that meet the reality. Uh, that do not meet the reality. So, and I don't know, I can't tell you whether that's true or not. Okay, let's go on to the next story here. Russia's Belgorod submarine could deploy Poseidon nuclear vehicles off the U.S. coast. Okay, so if you're wanting to ramp up the nuclear rhetoric and escalate that, that's what this is doing. And they always show this as like, see, Russia's not backing down. We're going to take it to them. And okay, Russia's Belgorod submarine may have deployed, may have, it, they didn't say it did, may have deployed uh, Poseidon nuclear vehicles off the American coast, Telegram channel and TV presenter and journalist so-and-so said. The Russian armed forces will use the weapon of retaliatory, uh, uh, of retaliation only as a countermeasure. Okay, but so we're, we're a victim and we'll fight back, but we'll, that's how they always portray this. And so this isn't really bringing any, de-escalating any, if that's what they're uh, thinking, you know, they always talk about like they're, they're de-escalating. They're really not. Okay. Yeltsin advisor says, now this was really, really absolutely fascinating. Yeltsin advisor says Ukraine denounced Crimea, Lviv, and other territories in 1991. Okay. So the Verkhana Rada, that is the Ukrainian parliament, a few days before signing the treaty on the establishment of the Commonwealth independent states in 1991, adopted a document according to which Kiev was losing Crimea and Western territories, or so they say. The document of the Ukrainian parliament that was denounced that denounced the treaty of the creation of the USSR in December 1922. Uh, okay, so what it's saying is the parliament denounced that the Soviet Union was formed at creating the USSR. And so they're saying because they denounced that, they don't actually get to keep the territories that they're in, in 19, presently in 1991. They're saying this, Ukraine legally returned itself to 1922 without Crimea, Lviv, and other regions, he said. Okay. Now, so to make sense of that, you would have to and also admit that then the 19, if that was the case, you would also have to admit that the 1994 uh, Budapest Memorandum, because if you're going to go back historically like that beyond Minsk, because they always talk about Minsk, the Budapest Memorandum should still be in effect. And the Russians should uh, be protecting Ukraine's current borders as internationally recognized, but they're not going to say anything like that because they want a one-sided argument. Okay, that's all that I have. If you have anything that you want to tell me about um, about FTX, about the Russian Orthodox or the Ukrainian Orthodox Moscow Patriot Church, I'd be happy to hear about it. If you have any other comments for me, I read every comment I can read. And I thank you so much for being the kind of person that cares enough to watch this video about Ukraine.